Okay, we have everything set. And so today is May 22nd, 2021. Okay, so we'll start by doing three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. And then we'll do the salutation to the Buddha. Namo tas namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa okay so good morning everybody Good morning. And we are now continuing now with our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya. That's the book of numerical discourses of the Buddha. And we're in the book of fours. And in this class, I want to go through a whole number of short suttas. Just find what's interesting in each one explain it, and then move on to the next. So we're going to be starting with sutta number 133. And these suttas all revolve around the theme of introducing a distinctions between four kinds of persons existing in the world. Okay, so now we have a distinction which comes to play a somewhat important role in the Theravada commentarial tradition. The distinction is made between a person who understands quickly, the person who understands with some elaboration of the teaching, the one who needs to be guided, and then the person for whom the word is the maximum. And I should explain that these are trans my translations of the terms, and the terms in the Pali are a bit obscure. So let's say we have a note here, which gives the Pali terms and some explanation of them. Can you see the screen? Is it amplified? Is it expanded enough? We can see it, Bhante. Okay. It could be made larger. Okay, let's, let's go a little bigger. This okay? Yeah, that's better. Yes, Bhante. We okay. Okay. So the four terms are ugati tanyu, which is what's translated as the one who understands quickly, but it literally means ugatita has the meaning of opened up, revealed, displayed, and then the suffix new. is based on the verbal root nya, which means to know or to understand. Let's get some notes. Yeah, there's a verbal root nya, which we get Words like jnana. Jnana is knowledge, panya is wisdom, and so forth. And then from this verbal root nya, we get a suffix. New, which is one who knows, one who understands. So the ugatinyo, at ugatinyo, is one who understands as soon as the teaching is expounded, as soon as the teaching is revealed. And by understanding here is not meant understanding, not simply understanding intellectually, but it is understanding by making the breakthrough, the abhisamaya, the realization of the truth of the Dhamma. In other words, attaining at least the stage of sotapati, was stream entry. 
So an example of somebody who was ugatin you, ugatin you, would be on your on your kandanyo, atta kandanyo. If you remember the story of the Buddha's first discourse, there were five ascetics who were listening to the discourse. And at the end of the discourse, it said that for the ascetic kandanyo, there arose the stainless, spot-free eye of the Dhamma, the dustless, stainless eye of the Dhamma arose in the venerable Kandanyo. So Kandanyo was the one who understood quickly. As soon as the Buddha expounded the Four Noble Truths, Kandanyo gained penetrative knowledge and the eye of Dhamma arose, Dhamma Chakru arose. He saw the truth of the Dhamma and became a stream into it. Another example of Ugatin Yu, Ugatin Yu, would be Venable Sariputta. If you remember the story of Sariputta, he was himself a wandering ascetic looking for a teacher. And then he met the Venable Asaji, another one of the Buddha's first five disciples. And when he saw Asaji, he was very impressed by his manner, his deportment. And he came up to Asaji and said, please tell me what kind of teaching you're following. And then Asaji recited just this four line stanza, whatever things there are that originate from a cause, the Tathagata has explained their cause and also their cessation. That is the teaching of the great ascetic. And as soon as Sariputta heard that, there arose in him the dustless, stainless eye of Dhamma, and he too became the stream enterer. And when we look into the suttas, we see many cases in which the Buddha expounds the Dhamma to somebody often who's never heard it before. And just while they're listening to the discourse, they gain realization, they gain penetration. So those are the people that we would call ugatinyu, ugatinyu, those who understand quickly, who gain realization as soon as the truth is opened up to them. The second type, and here we have a difference of readings, the Sri Lankan edition and the Pali Tech Society edition have vipachitanyu, whereas the Burmese edition has vipanchi tanyu. And though it seems like just a very slight difference, but the two words are actually different words with different meanings. Vipachita means ripened or cooked. So one who understands when their mind has been ripened or cooked, so to speak, And the Burmese reading vipanchitanyu, the word vipanchita means expanded or elaborated. So this would be one who understands when the teaching has been elaborated, has been elucidated that's in some detail. And then the commentary explains yeah, that this is one for whom the breakthrough to the truth occurs when the meaning of what has been stated briefly has been analyzed in detail. So going back to the Buddha's first sermon, when the Buddha gave the first sermon to the five ascetics, only Kandanya gained penetration immediately after the discourse. But the, but the narrative of the sutta, this is actually in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 26, says that after that, the Buddha had to explain to the other four ascetics over a period of several days 
he had to elaborate, expand, and explain the teaching. And in the course of those explanations, those other four ascetics gained the breakthrough to the Dhamma. So the other four ascetics would be those who understood through elaboration. So this is when the Buddha, after giving a concise teaching, then he'll expand it, elaborate, sometimes has to explain over in several sessions. And then with that elaboration, the person makes the breakthrough. The third type of person is called Nyeya. Yeah, the person is Neo, a person who has to be led or has to be guided. And so this is said to be the kind of person for whom the breakthrough to the Dhamma occurs gradually through instruction, questioning, yoniso manasikara, that's careful attention, and reliance on good friends. And it should be also added here that this is the person who gains the breakthrough through practice. So this is the person who has to undertake a kind of systematic course of practice developing, of course, based on the foundation of sila, or good conduct, then has to engage in developing the four foundations of mindfulness, developing samatha, some degree of samadhi, and then developing vipassana, developing insight. So the person who has to undertake some kind of systematic or methodical approach to meditative cultivation. And then the fourth type of person the Pali expression it's a bit obscure is padda paramo so the word padda has many meanings sometimes it can be like a state a condition a path but it also can mean a word or a term an expression. It could also mean a verse, like Dhammapada can be understood as verses on the Dhamma, or it could be understood as words of the Dhamma. So the Pataparamo person is one who sadly doesn't make the breakthrough to the Dhamma in the life in which he first receives the teaching. So even though this person hears much, recites much, memorizes many teachings, even teaches others, but they don't, they don't make the breakthrough in that life itself. But still they retain the teaching in their mind and that will act as a supporting condition for attainment in a future life. Okay, so this, those are the four types of persons. And let me go through another sutta, then we could take some questions. Okay, so remember this sutta. The next one is also an interesting. And I don't quite agree with the commentary here. So it said that there are these four kinds of persons found existing in the world. So what are the four? So we have the one who lives off the fruit of his effort. First, we'll go through the terms, then I'll explain. One who lives off the fruit of his effort, but not off the fruit of his karma. One who lives off the fruit of his karma, but not off the fruit of his effort. One who lives off the fruit of both his effort and his karma, and one who lives off the fruit of neither his effort nor his karma. Let's see what the commentary says. Note.
Okay, so this is one who passes the day energetically exerting himself and lives off whatever he gains as the fruit of this, the fruit of the effort. It says, but he does not obtain any meritorious fruits as a result of his exertion. That I don't agree with. The way I understand it, that this is a person who gains good results of his effort, but those results are not coming about through the fruition of past merits. So in the case of, first we'll take a case of how this applies in secular life and then how it applies in relation to Dhamma practice. So in the case of secular life, you could say we have a person who doesn't have an abundant store of merits from the past life, or at least those merits are not yet ready to ripen, but he undertakes a business and starts a business and works very hard, puts in a lot of energy in developing his business, a lot of thought, relies on skillful advisors, knowing competent advisors. He gets together an excellent staff and runs the business in this way, puts in many hours of hard work every day. And then the business becomes very successful. So in this case, we could say that the business succeeds as the fruit of his effort, the success of the business is the fruit of his effort, but it's not coming about through the ripening of merits in the past. Okay, so this would be the application to secular life. Now applied to Dhamma practice, we might have a person who doesn't have a very abundant store of merits related to the Dhamma from past lives. Of course, to encounter the Dhamma, that requires the ripening of or the conditioning force of some past merits. But this is a person who doesn't have, we would say, very abundant, very expansive, very powerful paramis from the past life. But they learn the Dhamma, they practice very diligently with they have strong sada, strong faith. They put in a lot of exertion and effort, strong virya, constant sati, develop their mindfulness. And so through the working of their energy and mindfulness rooted in their faith, they're able after maybe quite a long time to develop some degree of samadhi and then based on that samadhi, they develop their insight meditation and start to develop panya or wisdom. And maybe even the wisdom and samadhi working together even come to the point where they can gain the breakthrough to the Dhamma, gain a world transcending path and fruit. So in this case, we could say that their achievements in the Dhamma occur as the fruit of their effort, but not through the fruit of their karma. It's not that they have a powerful store of meritorious karma that's propelling their practice forward. Just like maybe we could see a sailboat going out on the bay, on the sea, and then it opens up the sail and there's a good wind blowing. And so the cells catch the wind and the wind propels the boat forward. But in the case of this practitioner, though they open the cells, but there's not a strong wind blowing. So they have to advance by the power of the engine of the boat, not through the force of the wind blowing through the cells. Okay, so that's the first kind of person. Okay, the second kind of person is one who lives off the fruit of his karma, but not off the fruit of his effort. 
Okay, so this is a person who has abundant meritorious karma from past lives. And so again, we'll apply it to secular life. So this is the person who starts a business, but they don't put in that much effort in the business. They just, you know, start the business. They have some employees. Um, maybe the person comes in a couple of hours in, in the morning and then goes off and spends the afternoon on the golf course or the tennis court or just um, relaxing at home. But somehow, it's a little bit hard to understand this, but they have some abundant store of meritorious karma that's coming to fruition and the business really takes off and becomes successful. Maybe, maybe if you know people like this, maybe we could bring, bring those cases up in the discussion period. Okay, so this would maybe would be like the person who goes out onto the bay with his sailboat and doesn't even have to turn on the motor very much, just turns on the motor enough just to get off the shore. Then he opens the sail and sure enough, a nice moderate wind comes blowing across and carries the boat out far on the bay and he doesn't, doesn't have the motor on. Okay, in the case of, let's say, the Dhamma practitioner, okay, this would be like a person who, maybe not a very diligent practitioner, so they just set out, they've just learned meditation, maybe for the first time, they go onto the meditation mat, turn their mind to the object. They don't have to put forward a very diligent effort. Maybe they're just sitting there for 20 minutes, half an hour, and wow, suddenly the mind becomes deeply concentrated. The nimitta appears and they develop the nimitta. They go into jhana and then they turn their mind to observation of the five aggregates and then the the pasananyanas start arising one after another and so we could say that this is the fruit of their past karma their past practice of the paramitas so they have abundant store of paramitas that have just been waiting there in the background and so as soon as the person encounters the Dhamma and starts to practice, even without much need for strong virya, strong diligence and heedfulness and energetic application, just turning the mind to the Dhamma a little bit. Of course, you, you have to put in some effort when one undertakes the practice, but as soon as one turns to the Dhamma, the accumulations of past karma, the past paramitas, start to ripen and propel the mind forward on the practice. It's a little bit like starting a fire. Like if you're making a barbecue, you, so you put the charcoal in and you put some paper in, but then you sprinkle the fluid lighter fluid over it, or barbecue fluid over it, and then you put the match to it. And as soon as you put the match, the paper catches, and then the fire flares up and the charcoals start to burn. So that's the one who lives off the fruit of his karma, but not the fruit of his effort. Okay, then you have one who lives off the fruit of both his effort and his karma. So this would probably be the typical case for one who achieves success. So one has to make some effort to start working diligently and vigorously, whether in secular life or in Dhamma practice. But then that practice will 
sort of stir up the accumulations of past karma, and so that the karma will start to ripen and work in synergy with one's effort and bring about the beneficial results. The commentary gives the explanation. Again, that's something that I didn't agree with. Uh, it says, those who live off the fruit of both effort and his karma, these are kings and royal ministers and so on. Maybe so, but not necessarily the case. I think this can apply to lots of people in secular life, both make the effort and then achieve the ripening of past karma. And in Dharma practice, those who make the effort and advance through the ripening of their karma. And then the fourth kind of person is the one who lives off the fruit of neither his effort nor his karma. So this is a person who is a failure both in secular life and in Dharma practice. In secular life, in business and work, they don't make much of an effort, nor do they have good karma that's coming to their rescue and bringing them success despite their lack of effort. And then in the terms of Dhamma practice, they don't make any diligent effort, nor do they gain the results of good karma from the past. Maybe this would be like the typical, maybe traditional Buddhist, even in the Buddhist countries who the extent of their Dhamma practice is going to occasional ritual ceremonies where they do the three refuges and the five, they recite the five precepts, but they don't make a diligent effort even to keep the precepts and they don't have past karma that's ripening, past merits that's ripening to help them advance in their practice. So those are the four kinds of person found existing in the world. And I say the practical application of this is we don't know what kind of karma we have in the past, whether we have sufficiently powerful, wholesome karma in the past. So we shouldn't take our past karma for granted. So we should make the effort. And if we have the sufficient accumulations of merits from the past, those merits will ripen and help us. And even if we don't have those powerful meritorious karma from the past, still our effort in the present will bring beneficial results in the present and will create wholesome karmic formations that will benefit us in the future. So in every case, effort is necessary. And just leave it to chance whether we have the powerful meritorious karma from the past to work in collaboration with our personal efforts. But don't shrug off the effort thinking, oh, I must have good karma from the past and that karma will help me in the present. Okay, maybe we could say any questions on these first two suttas. And before we take the questions, I just want to quickly get some water, then I'll be back. Wow, quite a few questions. Okay, we'll start with Chin Chin. 
Thank you, Bante. I wanted to ask, when you said about breakthrough the Dharma, what do you mean by that? Yeah, this is, I'm using this as an expression for what is also called gaining the Dhamma eye, seeing into the truth of the Dhamma. Um, and what it means in effect is realizing the four noble truths and attaining stream entry, the first stage of enlightenment, the first stage of realization. In, in a human lifetime, will one know that, that they have achieved that? You know, like when you say achieve jhana or samadhi, is that yeah. something you will know when you achieve it? When you achieve it, when you achieve it, you'll know that you've achieved this. But I have to add the question. It's also possible to have sometimes powerful experiences of samadhi or of even of insight and think that that is the breakthrough. That is the realization. But it's actually not. It's just a different kind of meditative experience. Is, is that achievable during one in, in a human life? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, it has to be achieved in the human life. Okay, sorry. Last question. Why is that Buddhas, a lot of them, or most of them, or all of them come from India? I'm not sure I understand the question. It's like, the, I have the impression that the Buddhas, most of them kind of like when they were born as a human, before they become Buddha yeah. or enlightenment, they were from India. Yeah. Why is that only India? Well, the historical Buddha, of course, arose in India, or actually geographically, actually, he was born in Nepal. So why is it what? most okay. all of Yeah. <clears throat> Probably because India had the suitable culture, background culture for the for the Buddha's teaching to be intelligible to his contemporaries. Um, because say in India at the time of the Buddha, there was the idea of rebirth was widespread. The idea that there was some connection between one's actions and the form of rebirth that one takes. There was a strong movement of religious, of renunciant ascetics who left the household life to adopt a life of meditation, contemplation, and investigation to realize the truth. So all of those conditions were present that were suitable for the Buddha to pursue his own quest for truth and to make his teaching intelligible. If, say, the Buddha had arisen in China at that time, no belief in rebirth in China. So he would have had to start off from scratch teaching something that in India people were already taking for granted, pretty much taking for granted. Yeah, so I would say the Indian culture and spiritual culture in the Buddha's time provided the adequate background for the Buddha to begin his teaching career. Okay, we'll have to move on. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you, Bhante. Okay, Ron? Yes, good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Um, I have a question. You said if someone has good karma, it's yeah. and they put the boat on the bay, they open up the sails, and a good wind propels them. Yeah. Well, if someone has bad karma, no matter how much effort they put in throughout their life, they're going to just experience repeated failure. So how does someone overcome bad karma? Like if you have bad karma, no matter what you do, you're going to get crushed. Um, maybe not necessarily. If the bad karma is strong enough, then no matter what one does, one will meet with failure. In that case, it's unavoidable, but in doing the good and making an effort to do good actions, one is building up the reserves of good karma for the future. So then that karma will get the opportunity to ripen and bring its desirable results. And also, so that, that, wait, wait, wait. That I, 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 bad life. I didn't, I didn't finish, I didn't finish. Okay. Okay, but well, suppose one has a bad karma tending to ripen in this life and one makes suitable effort, 
is possible that that bad karma is not necessarily, is not bound to ripen in that life. So by the suitable effort, one could block, obstruct the bad karma from ripening and then overcome the, the tendencies of the bad karma. And in that way, one could achieve success. So if the bad karma is inevitable, if it has to ripen in this life, then the effort will create good conditions, good karma, providing the conditions for success in a future life. If the bad karma is not necessarily bound to ripen in this life, then through suitable effort, one can overcome those negative karmic forces and achieve good results in this life. So what does one do when bad karma ripens? One has to endure, if the bad karma ripens in undesirable results, one has to endure them patiently, but instead one has to make the effort to cultivate good deeds, which will create merit that can counter the bad karma, possibly in this life, or in any case, establish the conditions for good results in a future life. But in any case, even if the bad karma is ripening, this provides opportunities for developing, especially the qualities of patience and equanimity, which are two, two powerful paramitas or positive forces of the mind. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, Young. Good morning, Bhante. Good morning. You just mentioned Dasaparami. I'm listening to your Dasaparami talk as well. And the effort, does it overlapping with the energy and also determination? Well, what I call effort and what is called energy are pretty much just two different terms for the same thing. In Pali, they're, well, yeah, they're represented by the word virya. So they're just two different terms for the same thing. Maybe you could say energy is the mental force and effort is the way that mental force is applied in action. But there are two sides of the same thing. Determination as a parameter is different, but it's, of course, it's connected with energy, but determination is making a mental resolve to do something, making a decision, and then to achieve excess to achieve the success of one's resolve, that requires energy. But the determination is the resolve itself, the decision to achieve a certain result. I see. And yeah. if one is um, Pada Parama with the, with the efforts, she can be a Neya. Is it a good strategy? If a person is Padda Parama. Mm -hmm. But with the efforts, can she be transformed to Neya? Um, it's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems that when the Buddha says that a person is Padda Parama, it may, the way it's understood, it means that they can't achieve the realization or the breakthrough in that life. So that they won't become Neya. The Neya is the person who can achieve the realization through the effort and training in that life itself. But the Pataparama, when they make the effort, when they train, they're building up the conditions for realization, but the realization just won't take place in that same lifetime. It will have to take place in a future life. That's the way I understand it. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, now we move to Deborah. Yeah, thanks, Sante. <clears throat> I think my two questions are uh, related. In the um, example of the person who um, lives off the fruit of the, his karma or her karma, but not off the fruit of his effort, could it be like someone who's inherited? wealth and they live off of that, but they don't um, add to the wealth. Oh, that's a good, that's a good example. Yeah, that could be a good example too. Okay. 
um, so then the person who lives off the fruit of neither his effort nor his karma, and I may be misunderstanding karma here, but is, is, is that someone who's had good enough karma that they're born into this realm, um, but maybe doesn't, on paper, they should do well, but they don't yeah. do well. Is that, am I misunderstanding karma? Um. Uh, just go over that. Go, go over that again. I didn't quite okay. Right. Um, so I think I've confused myself. Then the one who lives off uh, the fruit of neither his effort nor his karma, someone who's born into this realm yeah. with good enough karma to have been born into this realm. Yeah. But okay. Um, but is that then also like not a recognition? Sort of, you, you know, people who on paper have every advantage, but don't see it as that, don't do not do anything with that. I think I'm not getting that, how you would have good enough karma to um, be born into this realm and then not live off of it. I would, I would say that it's through good karma that one gets to be reborn in the human realm, mm -hmm. but, but probably this one, doesn't have such an abundance of good karma, even though they have enough good karma to be reborn in the human realm, but they don't have such an abundance of good karma as to bring about, you know, success in their undertakings in this realm. So we can say that living off the fruit of karma means that the karma brings success in one's undertakings. So this is a person who doesn't make an effort and so therefore doesn't achieve success through effort and doesn't have sufficient karma to bring success in their undertakings. That doesn't have a, six, enough karma so that their undertakings will bring success just through the ripening of karma apart I from see. their efforts. I see, like maybe an underachiever. I see, I see, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Okay, Diane. Thank you, Bante. Good morning. So the question will be, uh, can one who only have two roots, um, if they put a lot of efforts in this present life, attain the fruition while they are in the intermediary stage after death? I know these are questions I don't really know, <laughs> but I what what is this? That's really an Abhidhamma question rather than a Sutta question. But a person who has two good roots in their rebirth consciousness—that's the root of non-greed and non-hatred, but not the root of non-delusion or wisdom. That that person, it said, cannot attain the realization in that life, in that human life, whether they can achieve realization in the intermediate state, this I don't know. Okay. But my assumption would be in the intermediate state, they would still have the two roots, only the two roots, not the three roots. So my assumption is that they cannot achieve realization, but I don't know for sure. But even though in the, in the present life, they put a lot of effort and they, finally um, become non-delusion? That would have to come in the next life, I would think. But that's just my assumption, my guess. I don't know for sure. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Okay, Ali. Thank you, Bhante. I was wondering if uh, with the person that doesn't have... Uh, person that what? Yes, doesn't have the good uh, karma or doesn't put effort, doesn't uh, karma provide some effort? Doesn't, isn't uh, effort one of the uh, byproducts of having good karma? Um, a distinction is being made here between the point is whether one achieves success through the effort or through the ripening or support of the karma. Um, 
Yeah, so we have to bear that distinction in mind. Okay. Is the effort is not the one of the fruits of the karma, right? No, no. The no. effort the effort would be would would cre if, if the effort is applied to wholesome activity, it would create good karma in the present. But the effort itself is not the fruit of the karma. Okay, okay. And then the, uh, lastly, for you know, the very late question that I have is that can the karma be understood in like some of the uh, genes that one is given, like is born with perhaps with the intelligence? Is that like part of the uh, karmic? I, yeah, of course, this would be like a, a, a modern explanation of how karma works since the Buddhist texts don't have the knowledge about you know, the genetic transmission. But one would say that having good genes would be a mechanism through which karma is able to bring about its desirable results. Okay. Say, okay, so said so that the results of good karma, some of the results would be good health, long lifespan, intelligence, having pleasant features, and so on. And some of, yeah, you know, all of those would be, um, at least in part genetically determined. And so we could say that the genes are the channel through which karma is able to bring about the results. Okay. But I was still like a bit uh, confused on the first part that, that about the effort. The uh, effort is not carried on by the fru fruition of some sort of a karma. I think everything is including the effort that one exerts, no? No, the effort itself is not the fruit of the karma. Okay. The, the effort is would go into the creating good karma in this life. Okay, we're going to move on Thank now you. To, yeah, to look at some of the other suttas. Okay, so now we move on. Okay, Sutta 135, we have four kinds of persons. The blameworthy, mostly blameworthy, slightly blameworthy, and the blameless. Yeah, these I think need little explanation. So how is a person blameworthy? The person engages in blameworthy bodily action, verbal action, and mental action. That's the person maybe who's entirely blameworthy. The one who's mostly blameworthy, most of their action is of whether a body, speech, and mind is blameworthy, but probably occasionally they will do some good and praiseworthy deeds, but most of the actions are bad person slightly blameworthy, um, most of their action of body, speech, and mind is blameless, but occasionally they'll do some things that are blameworthy. And how is the person blameless? So here the person engages in blame, consistently in blameless action of body, speech, and mind. So that way, that way they're blameless. Yeah, so that's Everything there is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, here we have four kinds. Now we come to Sutta 136. Four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What are the four? Okay, here some person does not fulfill sila, virtuous behavior, concentration, that's samadhi, and wisdom, panya. Another person fulfills virtuous behavior, but not concentration and not wisdom. Another person fulfills virtuous behavior and concentration, but doesn't fulfill wisdom. And still another person fulfills virtuous behavior, concentration and wisdom. So sila, samadhi, panya, so those are the three aggregates of the training, or the three types of training. And so the sutta seems self-explanatory on the surface, but I think that there's a deeper explanation that the commentary will bring out. So let's look at the commentary. So it says that the first, the person who fulfills neither of the three trainings, that is the multitude of worldly people, ordinary worldly people. The second person who fulfills virtuous behavior but doesn't fulfill concentration and wisdom, it says that this is the dry, wait, this is the dry insight stream enterer 
and the once returner. So according to this, the stream enterer with dry insight fulfills virtuous behavior, but not concentration and wisdom. And when you see this, you think, well, doesn't, can you become a stream enterer just by developing, by holding the precepts without any concentration, without any wisdom? No, that's not the case. Even to become a stream enterer, you have to have some virtuous behavior, sila. You need some degree of samadhi, concentration. You need some degree of wisdom. The key word here is what one fulfills, what one brings to fulfillment. And so the stream enterer fulfills virtuous behavior in that they acquire the attainment of stream entry, they acquire the virtues, the sila, dear to the noble ones, which means that they are consistent and diligent in their observance of at minimum the five precepts, that they don't violate the five precepts, they don't break the five precepts, they don't compromise the five precepts, they don't uh, trample upon the five precepts, even to a slight degree. So it's said that for the noble one, they observe the five precepts without breach, without blemish, without um, holes or tears in their observance of the precepts. But they don't necessarily attain deep samadhi to the level even of access concentration or absorption concentration. And of course, to achieve stream entry, you need wisdom, but the wisdom has not yet developed to the point that it eradicates all the defilements. It's just enough to eliminate the three lowest fetters, the three basic fetters of the view of self, doubt, and clinging to, to rules and observances. Okay, now we have the person who fulfills virtuous behavior and concentration, but not wisdom. And according to the commentary, so this will be the non-returner. This is the non-returner. Now, the commentary recognizes a dry insight meditator who becomes a non can become a non-returner or even an arhat. So what is the concentration for the non-returner? Probably the standard concentration for the non-returner would be the attainment of the jhanas, at least the first jhana. But the dry insight meditator doesn't attain any jhanas. But the commentary gives a rather interesting and unusual explanation here. It says that the dry insight meditator fulfills concentration because he obtains momentary jhana, which is the basis for rebirth. It's a rather puzzling expression. And I actually mistranslated it in the published version of the numerical discourses. I said he obtains momentary concentration arisen on the basis of his object a momentary jhana arisen on the basis of his object. But the Pali has tankani kamti upapati nimitakam jhana pati labati. So pati labati is obtains. Jhana, of course, is jhana. And tankanika means at that moment. And then the expression upapati nimitikam, nimitika here is a basis serving as a basis for an upapati actually means rebirth. So it's said that this dry insight meditator who is the non-returner obtains a momentary jhana, which is the basis for rebirth. 
And this seems to be actually an explanation different from that in other commentaries. And even from, I think, the Visuddhi Magga, which holds that the dry insight meditator doesn't obtain jhana at all. But the non-returner is reborn in the form realm, doesn't take rebirth in the desire realm. And so to be rebirth, to be reborn in the form realm, one would need, it would seem that one would need some jhana as the cause for rebirth in the form realm. And so what the commentary seems to be saying is that the even the dry insight meditator in close to the death process attains a momentary jhana, which then becomes the cause or basis for their rebirth in the form realm. So they don't enter into a sustained jhanic attainment, but just for a moment, they obtain jhana. And that jhana is able to serve as a condition or cause for the non-returner to take form to take rebirth in the form realm, probably in one or another of the pure abodes. Okay, so that is the third person mentioned here. Then the fourth person is the one who, and just by just remaining with the third person. So just by obtaining that momentary jhana close to the death process, that would be enough to say that this person fulfills, fulfills samadhi. Okay, then we have the person who fulfills sila, samadhi, and panya, good conduct, concentration, and wisdom. So that is the arahat. Let's see if we have a few suttas here. Uh, this one doesn't really add anything new. Yeah, what I wanted to do was to go to another sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Threes. Okay, let me open it. Ah, okay. Okay, so this is sutta number 87. Yeah, we, we don't have to take the whole passage, but it speaks about here a bhikkhu, a monk, fulfills virtuous behavior, but cultivates concentration and wisdom only to a moderate extent. Actually, this statement is somewhat better clear makes it clearer than the statement in number in the book of fours 136 which says that the person does not fulfill concentration and wisdom which gives the impression that the person doesn't have concentration and wisdom at all but the book of threes makes it clear that this person cultivates concentration and wisdom only to a moderate extent. Actually, that's not the sutra that I wanted. It's this one, which starts off in the same way. Okay, so this person fulfills virtuous behavior, but cultivates concentration and wisdom only to a moderate extent. And then it said that with the utter destruction of three fetters, he is a stream enterer, no longer subject to the lower world and so on. Okay, so this sort of 
corresponds to the second type of person mentioned in 4136, the one who fulfills virtuous be uh, the one who fulfills virtuous behavior, but not concentration on wisdom. And then the second person that mentioned here also fulfills virtuous behavior by concentration of wisdom only to a moderate extent. And this one with the utter destruction of three fetters and the diminishing of greed, hate, and delusion, he's a once returner. So these two, the stream enterer and the once returner are those who fulfill sila, but not samadhi and panya, but they do develop samadhi and panya, but only to a moderate extent. Then here we have the one who fulfills virtuous behavior and concentration, but cultivates wisdom only to a moderate extent. And so instead of this person, with the utter destruction of the five lower fetters, he is one of spontaneous birth who attains final Nibbana there without returning from that world. In other words, this becomes the non-returner. And then the one who fulfills virtuous behavior, concentration and wisdom, this person with the utter destruction of the asavas realizes the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom, enters in it and dwells in it. So this is the arahat. So we could see from this sutta, Book of Threes, number 86, that even though the Book of Four says that the person doesn't fulfill concentration and wisdom, but it doesn't mean that they utterly neglect concentration and wisdom. It's just that they've developed them only to a moderate extent not yet brought them to fulfillment. And the fulfillment of concentration, really the complete fulfillment would be the attainment of the four jhanas. And the fulfillment of wisdom would be developing the wisdom to the extent that it eradicates the asavas, the deep primordial defilements that maintain the cycle of repeated birth and death. Let's just see whether there's any other interesting suttas to follow, then we'll take questions. Okay, number 137, pretty much just corresponds to 136, expresses it in a different way. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting one. It's something that we might know from personal experience four kinds of persons who go on retreat <laughs> or in relation to retreat. So one goes on retreat by body, but doesn't, but not by mind. One doesn't go on retreat by body, but goes on retreat by mind. One who goes on retreat, one who does not go on retreat either by body or by mind, and one who goes on retreat both by body and mind. Okay, so this is the person who goes on retreat <laughs> <laughs> by body, but not by mind. And maybe this is the typical experience of a person who goes on a meditation retreat, at least in the initial stages. So they resort to remote lodgings in the forest or the jungle, or they go to a meditation monastery or monast or meditation center. They go to a meditation center or a monastery to join a retreat. They get the instructions, keep your mind on the breath, observe the feelings and so on, or do the thoughts of loving kindness, whatever the retreat is concerned with. And they start off mindful in, mindful out, mindful in, mindful out. But then there arise thoughts of sensual desire. Then come the thoughts of anger and ill will, thoughts of harming and injury. And they spend their retreat enveloped by those thoughts and maybe at the end of the retreat finally they think oh i'm supposed to have my mind on the breath or on loving kindness 
Okay, so that's the retreat by body, but not by mind. A person doesn't go on retreat by body, but they go on retreat by mind. So they don't go out to remote lodgings in the forest, but they have thoughts of renunciation, goodwill, and harmlessness. So I've known in Sri Lanka, monks living in busy urban temples, you know, where a lot of people are coming for devotional services, a lot of maybe ceremonies are taking place, a lot of lay people visiting other monks in the monastery. But I've known some monks living in those conditions, but they stay quietly in their room and practice very, very diligently. Of course, I don't know what's going on in their mind, but they, when they come out, they seem to have be self-possessed, to have mindfulness and clear comprehension in all activities. And some are reputed even to be jhana attainers, or to be to, to have deep insight realizations. Okay, the person goes on retreat neither by body nor by mind, so they don't go to a retreat setting, and they are thinking worldly thoughts. And then the one who goes on retreat, both by body and by mind, this is the person who goes to a retreat in a remote dwelling place, but to a meditation center or monastery, and they have wholesome thoughts, and we could say that they develop their meditation subject successfully. Okay, any questions based on these suttas? Okay, Vindu. Yep, good morning, Bhante. Um, good morning. I, yep, I have one question actually uh, regarding um, the momentary concentration. Um, is this related to, um, say, the um, Datu Vibhanga Sutta and the part on space? where Pukusati, uh, basically, I would guess that he contemplate on space, on momentarily concentration when he was hit by the stray cow and that he died. And he went to the um, pure abode. Yeah. He didn't get to um, become a, an arahant. It's, yeah. uh, could you explain when he contemplate on space, um, where the four elements plus one space, is that space actually momentary concentration? I don't think the space is momentary concentration because in that sutra, the Buddha is explaining to Pukasati, the, the, young, the young monk, he's explaining the six elements. So he's actually, so the Buddha is actually teaching Pukasati that insight meditation subject based on the elements, using the elements as the foundation. And it seems that Pukasati, Pukasati, the way I understand it, he would have, even before he met the Buddha, he had been practicing, it said in the commentary, mindfulness of breathing, and he had attained the jhanas based on mindfulness of breathing. So he was already a jhana attainer, but what he lacked was the teaching on wisdom, the teaching that will for developing wisdom. And so when the Buddha met him, the Buddha went straight into a wisdom teaching and the elements was part of that wisdom teaching. Yeah, thank you. Um, a follow-up question is actually regarding Bahia. Bahia, when um, the Buddha basically taught him, see yeah. as what you have seen, hear as what you have heard. Yeah. And that he, he, he also, got hit by this stray cow and he died and yeah. he became an arahant. Yeah. So um, what is the difference? Because Bahia and Pukusati, as I understand from the commentary, they will practice together in their previous life and uh, yeah. in the mountain and that they die because yeah. they didn't attain anything. So yeah. why one, like uh, Pukusati were able to attain uh, um, Anagami, yeah. And um, Bahia become a Narahan. So what is the difference between two of them, this Aryan? I guess I could only offer a guess 
And that yep. is my, my guess is that Bahia's faculty of wisdom was stronger and sharper than that of Pukasati. Because Bahia attained our hardship not when he was hit by the bull. He attained our hardship when the Buddha gave him that brief instruction. So bah Bahia would be an Ugati Tanyu type. Okay. That is, he attained not just penetration, not just the breakthrough of the stream entry, but he attained our hardship right away, right off the right, just with one with teacher. Right, okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that would be my guess. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, we'll take one more question, then we'll have to end. So this is Julie, Julian. Um, good morning, Bante. Good morning. Bante, the uh, attainment of the third fruit uh, is because of the uh, uh, dropping all the f uh, five lower factors, right? With the attainment of the five of the third fruit, then one cuts off the five lower factors. Yeah. Yeah. But is such a person the, on death always reborn in the um, uh, form realm? Because um, what if he doesn't have um, the concentration? Is 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 it a, a prerequisite to be to have concentration before you can a jhana before you can be reborn in the form realm? Yeah, this is just the issue that I was discussing. Um, the normal assumption is to be, or the normal governing principle, to be reborn in the form realm, one needs jhanic attainment. Okay, but now the, the commentary is dealing with the case of a dry insight meditator who doesn't develop the jhanas. So the question is, how can that <clears throat> dry insight meditator Um, who becomes a non-returner, how are they reborn? How are they to be reborn in the form realm? And the explanation given by this commentary is that they develop this momentary jhana, which is the basis for their rebirth. So it would seem that shortly before death, just for a moment or a few moments, they develop jhana, and that jhana then becomes the cause for them to take rebirth in the form realm or the, uh, in the desire, yeah, in the form realm. So it seems that jhana is, um, is a prerequisite. Is, is what? It's a prerequisite. So, a, but, yeah, but a, from, from this explanation, hmm. it's not the case that one has to intentionally develop the jhana as in a systematic, methodical way. But the practitioner of dry insight meditation, as death approaches, will sort of automatically go into a jhana. If they've reached the stage of non-returner, then they will go into the jhana. And that jhana will then become the basis for their rebirth in the form realm. Of course, you could have actually practiced more and become a rahan on the spot. Because well, there are some suttas which um this this um this bhikkhus uh, were explaining the his attainment and he yes. was talking about seeing the water but not having the the bucket or the ropes uh, to bring yeah. up the water yeah and as he was explaining he became a rahan yeah of course it's the non-returner can can progress to our hardship but we're just mm -hmm. taking the case of the non-returner who's going to be reborn in the form in the form realm. thank you okay we're, okay we'll have to end now for the day so Next week, we will not be having the Saturday class because next weekend we have, through Buddhist Global Relief, we'll be having a three day online retreat on the four Brahma Viharas. That's Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. If you haven't, if you want to join that retreat and you haven't registered yet, go to the website of Buddhist Global Relief and there'll be the announcement about the retreat and you can register for it there. So the next class will be the first Saturday in June. Okay, so let us end with the sharing of the merits. So I'll recite the verses for sharing the merits. 
May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. Sadhu, 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 Okay, thank you. Bante. Good health to you. Thank you, Bante. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank I'll you, Bante. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.